All right, so tonight's story is brought to, oh, before I get started on the story, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, next weekend, September 5th, um, I'm going to be traveling, so there will be no Story Night Europe next weekend. And uh, welcome to Story Night, Gav. Um, I'm story Night is where I tell the history of the Denis people from their origins on Gartonet through the end of the last restoration. So tonight's story is brought to you in part by dpwr.net for the Denis dates, uruarchives.com for the surface history corresponding to the, to the Denis dates, and the Cavernian Calendar Converter, which was written by Brett Middleton of the Fuzzy Physics Institute for converting between Denis and surface time. Tonight's story is from Mist, the Book of Tiana. As we progressed through the stories of the kings, we saw many changes in the Denis culture. We saw an austere lifestyle that began with King Rinneref, supplanted by greed and avarice that began with King Shomat. We saw a devotion to Yavo in a single faith, supplanted by diverse religions and religious beliefs numbering over 2,000, diminishing to just a handful by the end of King Kareth's reign. Because of the writings of a martyred, self-proclaimed prophet named Gish, we saw their belief system being hijacked and steered away from the words and teachings of Yavo. With King Jeron, Kareth's grandfather, we learned how the classes had become the most divided they ever were in their entire history, but the more violent factions of Dini decided to follow Yavo more closely hoping for a peaceful solution to their differing point of view. Gish's writings resulted in a conservative culture within Denis society, a culture that held the Arotanti, the outsiders, with great disdain and contempt. This general attitude among the Denis was another contributing factor in the demise of a once great empire. We also looked at the Midis War, which occurred during the early 8th millennium of Dini history. It was a war that was once again started by violent factions who were vehemently against contact with the Arotanti. This prejudice, though not held with the same violent emotions, was still felt by the majority of Dini society, a society that was very ethnocentric as well as xenophobic. These feelings and opinions remained prevalent up to the fall. We also learned about the origins of Yisha's journey ages, who created them and why. We learned about Agaris, the architect of the fall. His motives were not ethnocentric, nor did they stem from xenophobia. He was driven strictly for revenge, revenge for being wrongly accused and convicted of a crime he did not commit, revenge that drove him to commit genocide against his own people, a character flaw that would spell the end of an empire. Also, there are the beginnings of Atris, one of the heroes of the fall, the excavation of the great shaft and of a friendship with Viovis, who would become one of the villains of the fall. We learned about a surface dweller named Anna, her life and how she came to find the cavern, and those same old Dini fears of the Arotanti and the outsiders and their possibly corrupting influence on the Dini populace. <coughs> We learned of Anna's time in prison, her learning the Dini language, and of Yovis' anger, which started to burn against her over the beliefs of his beliefs in Dini elitism and, the suprem and supremacy over all other races. We learned of Anna's trial and of her uncertain future, and even more of Yovis' anger. Last time, we learned how Anna came to live with Atris's parents, how Yovis, through his arrogance, assumed that Anna would not come to his first book celebration. We learned how Atreus took exception to his friend's snubbing of Anna, and in turn snubbed his friend 
for making him choose between the two. And finally, deciding to write an age with Anna. Tonight, we will learn of a soulmate found and a friendship broken. <coughs> In the Dini year of 9368, approximately 1712 AD on the surface, about nine years after Sir Isaac Newton became chairman of the Royal Society in Great Britain, Atreus decided to, to, go, to go against his friend Viovis's wishes and have the Arotan, Anna, join him in writing an age together. In the months that followed, the friendship between Viovis and Atreus was strained. Both sensed that all was not well between them, and they both kept fairly much to themselves. This did not last. As Anna was a quick study, it did not take long for Atreus to teach her to read and write in common Dene and the Garohevti, the great words that were used to write the descriptive books of the ages. Over the next several months, they worked closely together, writing their age, which was as yet unnamed. When it was finished, and as it was required by Dene law, the Guild of Maintainers was contacted. They were asked to link to the, into this new age and verify that it did not violate the rules of age construction and that it was safe for use. When the inspection was complete, a report was sent to Atris. Unfortunately, about two weeks later, a young man from the Guild of Maintainers made an offhand remark to Viovis. Viovis went ballistic. He confronted Atris in the guild hall, asking if it were true that he had taught Anna how to write and had her help him write his new age. Viovis accused Atris of lying, that he had promised not to teach Anna about the art. Atris reminded him that he had only promised Viovis that he would consider it. After accusing Atris of sophistry, he stormed out, threatening to take the matter before the council. Viovis made good on his threat, arguing that no one of non dini blood should be allowed to use, let alone to write, an age. The council's decision was unanimous, and, at Viovis' urging, not only was a precedent set, but an example was made. The final result was that not only was Atris' age confiscated, but the family age of Koa was as well. This brought great shame to the family of Atris, to the family of Atris's father, Callus. Anna felt sick. After all, this was her fault. If she had not participated, this would never have happened. In addition, Atris was considering resigning from his seat on the council. She had to do something. But what? Then, she remembered Atris talking of his friendship with the Grand Master from the Guild of Legislators. Kedri was his name. Maybe if she went to see him. Surely there had to be something in the almost 10,000-year history of the Dene that would reverse the council's decision. Grandmaster Kedri was not so sure. Even if a precedent was found, there was no guarantee that the council would listen, let alone adhere to it. After she left, he began to think. There would be no way to know for sure unless he tried. He liked Atris and didn't feel that he and his family were being treated fairly. Still, he was but one man, and the chore of looking through 6,000 years of recorded guild history was a daunting task. Fortunately, 
a brand new batch of cadets, fresh from the academy, had arrived at the guild hall, waiting for their first task. He had the perfect assignment in mind. He needed to be discreet, keeping the knowledge of this activity from the council, and Viovis in particular. What better way to use these cadets? Cadets that were eager to please and impress him. He would split two rocks with a single blow, as the old Denis expression went. <coughs> Kedri instantly liked Anna when they had first met. He thought about her after she left their meeting. He appreciated her intelligence and inquisitive mind, the match of any guildsman. Had she been Denis, she would have made an excellent choice for a bride for young Atris. <coughs> Meanwhile, both Atris and his father resigned their posts. Callus's resignation, he having nothing to do with the current situation, was rejected. On the other hand, Atris had shown poor judgment. Lord Aenea accepted his resignation. All that remained was for the remaining four lords to sign the document. Upon her return to Callus's home, she announced that she was sorry for her part in their shame, and so would leave. Neither Callus nor his wife Tessera, surprisingly, would hear of such a thing. She was a member of their family, and as such they would stay together. It took about two weeks, but one of the cadets returned to, to Kedri with the news. The cadet a lad by the name of Neferis, thought that for an outsider to be able to use a linking book, he would have to be close to someone very important. As a result, he looked at the clerks who worked for the five lords. There were six of them who lived during the time after Kareth, when the council was first set up to its current form, who were Arotanti. Kadri was satisfied. Though the text was ancient, a precedent was a precedent, and Lord Aenea agreed. What had taken the entire council to decide against Atris was undone by a single stroke of Aenea's pen. There was a precedent, so Atris was innocent of all charges, and the books were to be returned to the family. Leovis had come to him, begging him to put the ancient precedent aside. Aenea would hear none of it, so Viev was left, angry and resentful. Aenea wondered what trouble would come of that, but this was the Denis way, and had been for a thousand generations. No man, regardless of how great or powerful, was more important than Denis. So it is, and so it must be, until the end of time, Aenea said to himself. There remained bad feelings between Atris and Viovis over this matter. Viovis was so full of pride and hate and wanted to have his own way so much that they couldn't really be close friends anymore. Over the next few years, Anna and Atris worked on their age together. They shared the love of surveying, geology, and exploring. It was during this time that Atris taught her the Denis game of Gemadet a three-dimensional game of six in a line, where players tried to be the first one to get six pieces in a row. It became their favorite evening pastime. They decided on a name for their age. Gemadet. <coughs> because the Denis are so long-lived, they thought nothing of tasks taking several years to complete, as long as they were thorough in their work. 
let alone several weeks. Atra spent several weeks creating a gift of sorts for Anna. He had made a well near the Lincoln place for their age. He made an intricate carving in the lid of the well. When he was finished, he brought Tiana down into the chamber with the cover in place overhead. As the sun reached its zenith, beams of light shone through the, through the cover, spelling out on the water below the Dini word for, or the Dini word, Shora, which means peace. She marveled that he thought nothing of working so hard just for one moment of magic. One night, while they were surveying, it rained rather heavily. Anna stood out in the rain, and beckoned Atris to join her. He was reluctant at first, but she was insistent. When he finally came out, she invited him to dance with her in the rain. <coughs> Being of the rock, he had never done this before, nor had anyone he had ever known. He found that he rather enjoyed it, especially since it was with her. Time passed quickly for these two. As they worked closely together, so did their feelings grow for one another. He gave her the pet name of Tiana, a play on Dini words. Tiana meaning storyteller and Anna being her name. Eventually she asked his father, eventually he asked his father for his blessing. Collis remarked that since Atris would not take his advice and reconsider asking her to marry him, he would indeed give his blessing. Atris had already asked Grand Master Kedri if there were going to be any legal issues with him marrying Anna, and there were not. <coughs> with no obstacles in their way, he asked Anna to marry him. She accepted. The last remaining formality was to go before the full council and ask for their approval. When Viovis heard this news, he was livid. Never while there's a breath left in my body. In the council chambers, <coughs> in the council chambers, Lord Aenea asked for those who approve of the marriage. The chamber was filled with a resounding I. When he asked for those opposing the marriage, there was but a single voice saying, No. Viovis. Without a unanimous vote, there would be no marriage. At first, Atris was willing to accept the council's decision. However, his mother suggested that if he truly loved Anna, he should go to Viovis and beg if necessary. Atreus went to Viovis, but with something different in mind. He brought up Viovis' oath to grant anything in his power to Atreus, for Atreus, ha for Atreus having saved his life back during the excavation of the great shaft. Though he was hesitant, Viovis agreed, saying that, From this day forth, I wish neither to speak with you nor hear from you again. Whatever once existed between us is now at an end. All promises are met. You understand? To which Atris replied, I understand, and I thank you. You thank me? Viovis gave a bitter laugh. Just go, for I am sick of the sight of you. And so began a love affair and a life between soulmates, and ended a friendship that had lasted for over thirty years.
please join us next time for a special treat, a relevant story to the fall, but not of the fall. The End